Okay, it's another episode of Talk to Thorin, and my guest for this one is Adam Apicella, who is the Vice President of League Ops at Activision Blizzard, and obviously has been involved with MLG for a long time. Actually, I've got that wrong. Shouldn't I have said it? League Ops at MLG, presumably, right? Yeah. That's I think people understand the premise, though. But mainly coming from the MLG world, obviously. So I wanted to start the interview by just getting kind of like what the general tone is for how Blizzard, uh, MLG rather, has chosen to like feature certain games heavily and then why sometimes you, you have to move away from them. Because I know every time I've ever had discussions with people behind the scenes in the industry, the reasons why are almost nothing to do with what the fan might think. The fan would just think stuff like, is the game really popular? Do you think there's a future in the game? You know, very, very simple, very naive questions like this. So... Actually, even though you guys come from the world of, obviously, the console games, we've got COD, we've got Halo, etc., one of the first areas that a lot of people outside of that sort of niche American community of gamers really would know MLG was the StarCraft Two days, because this was actually a, a period where I feel like your company was the one that really was synonymous with that heyday of StarCraft Two that people so fondly look back on and they, they think of it as a golden era, you know, when that was when StarCraft Two was the number one game in the world, whatever that title means, you know, it was never the most played, but certainly in esports, it had that kind of cachet and all the companies were vying to put on tournaments and famously, MLG had many that were, were very lauded in the time so i noticed yours was one of the first companies to kind of move away from starcraft 2 and to kind of like pull out early on and it didn't seem from the outside as just someone watching the events as though it was anything necessarily to do with like not like in the game or anything because it's not like you waited till the end and then we're like right there's nothing left here you know likewise it's not as though your last events weren't that good i mean i remember the ones you had in like 2013 they still seemed like pretty popular had a lot of top players what in general was the logic for moving away from StarCraft 2 is it, how, how would you describe it? So, I mean, I think in general, um, there's, we've, I've been uh, involved in two different sides of this. One, our current iteration where, where we work on uh, the publisher side where um, an Activision Blizzard title, certainly we have, um, it's a different scenario, right? And a different um, assessment when we're going to run a, an internal title um, versus when we were third party um, and, you know, third party for this conversation is like an ESL or a DreamHack or sure. um, a Face It. Um, a lot of times that um, we'll build a business around a game and uh, kind of the rug will get pulled out from under us. I'm not saying that in terms of StarCraft, but just in general, like there's a lot of external factors. Um, every year you have to go in and uh, reapply for a new license and every event you have to sort of pitch to the publisher like what you want to do. and. Um, you have to, when you're a third party operator, you have to make sure that the game that you're running and the, the program you're running, that at the end of the day, your number one priority is to keep the lights on, to pay your employees, to, to make sure you don't lose your ass on a program. And, uh, you know, that's number one, uh, number one priority when you're, when you're, when you're assessing whether you can continue operating a game and a program. And with Starcraft specifically, that was a precarious time for the game. Um, it was sort of like that tipping point when, uh, the publishers started to to pay attention and say, hey, I want to be involved in this more than just a, a one-off marketing thing like BlizzCon. Um, I want to actually kind of invest into the space and, and own it. And uh, we were, I, I would say like when it, when we transitioned there with WCS, uh, it was, I think if both parties approach it today, knowing what everyone knows today, that would have com gone completely different. I think there's a lot of naive people in the room on all sides. And I think it, that going from like an ATP tennis style open circuit that kind of celebrated the key differences of all these operators and um, together that ecosystem um, was kind of the the conglomeration of all of our all of our tournaments and it kind of made an awesome scene to to what it kind of morphed into overnight. I just don't think the scene was ready for it and our business certainly couldn't support it. The deal was a little upside down for everybody involved and um, that game specifically, um, if we could go back in time, I would have loved to have done it different. I just think uh, it, it was a lot of naive people in the room again that, that kind of put that deal together. And, and if we were able to redo it again, I think that um, it would have gone a lot differently. Sure. So speaking more generally, and it, listen, go into detail on any of these that I cite if you want, but there have been a few other games which you weren't as heavily involved in as StarCraft 2, because like I say, you really were one of like the premier operators at the time, and people remember those events. Yep. But for example, a lot of people who are involved in modern-day League of Legends won't even be aware, because they can't remember the pre-LCS days, that MLG did a whole bunch of 
the League of Legends tournaments. I mean, I, mean, I remember going to one of them. It was the one in Dallas in like early 2013. And I, the reason that this was significant to me is that this is where I think it was actually just like some of the first LCS games were played. Like like one of them play days was on this day. And I went for the StarCraft II tournament. You know, I was going to watch like, I think it was the Winter Championship because you guys had those wacky ways of naming the champ. Even though it was in like March yeah. or something. It was the Winter Championship. And I yeah. remember, right, this was the one where it was like, you know, Flash was like playing and he was in the fucking finals. And, and I remember sitting there and going, how is it possible that this is for StarCraft II? Like, you know, a massive event. And then I look over at the League of Legends one and that's just a play day of like you know just league matches not even a championship or anything it's not like a traditional LAN and they had so many fans on their side of the room you know on the League of Legends side and I remember thinking wow you know this isn't just hype League of Legends is probably the future of esports but that basically was almost the end of MLG in League of Legends now I realize the LCS era pretty much cut out all the third party operators etc but it's not as though League's the only one you know you, you had a bunch of Dota tournaments. You've done that from time to time. It felt like you've flirted with that more. You've done some, and then you've waited a while, then you've done other ones. Obviously, uh, more recently, people will know the CS Ventures. You know, you've had a few events in that one. In general, is there is there are all of these games got totally separate reasons as to why you didn't continue on, why they didn't become like mainstays of MLG? Is there an overarching like philosophy as to why? You do games sometimes, like you kind of float with them, like I say, you do a few of them, see how those goes, but you don't necessarily make it like, this is our main game and it's going to be, you know, we're going to have two games, for example, for the whole circuit for the whole year. What's what's in general with so many of the games, the philosophy? I think there's, generally speaking, um, three big buckets for game assessment for me personally. One, um, there's the the games that uh, have pretty much zero guard guardrails and zero ecosystem by the publisher. I would put the, the Valve titles pretty close to that. I think um, with Dota and CSGO, and it, it's different scene like today. Every day they kind of add, like some of the stuff they announced at TI was great um, in terms of the program, um, or right around TI. Um, but those games are so open that um, I feel like all the third party operators, um, they sort of squeeze the life out of the game and it, it, to the point of, because of oversaturation. and um so there there's one bucket of games right and we have to like sure. get to really assess that based on like the the climate of competition the calendar like uh, at one point i think we were running a dota event we had to cancel anaheim in like 2015 because there was a tournament on the same weekend there's a tournament before there's a tournament after then the uh, valve announced the t international qualifier dates and it was gonna at the time like three years ago it was a hundred fifty thousand dollar tournament that was a big tournament at the time and we're like, we, fuck, we can't run this. We're going to lose our ass and um, no one's going to care. It's going to be in the middle of all of this stuff. Um, so that's <laughs> one, like the the, the zero, uh, the ecosystem that's completely ungoverned by the, the, by the publisher. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, the second uh, group I would say is the one that's over uh, governed by the publisher. And I, I would put League of Legends squarely as the number sure. one example of that. And, um, and in between is the is the games where you kind of get a semblance of control where you can kind of create a business. I would say Halo was pretty, uh, uh, that's a good example where we did a deal with, we, we would get a license and, um, we would be able to run, run our business and we would have some semblance of control, whether it's dates or being able to help work with the publisher to create the, the sanctioning system. We had that with call of duty, uh, before we were, we were purchased. Um, and I would say that every one of those buckets has its own kind of like assessment of uh, of whether you're going to run that title or be able to operate it. And um, I would say the ones that I would obviously the ones in the middle are probably the best when when a third party operator can have kind of some semblance of control to to make sure that they're, it makes sense for their business and it makes sense for the ecosystem uh, for the game. I think that's the number one um, ideal scenario. I think the open-ended system is 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 dangerous, uh, and I've said this before. CS:GO and Dota, like I'm down to run it when it's when it feels special. But if I'm just running another tournament um, amidst a myriad of other tournaments, it's not as provocative to me. Um, but those are my three kind of big um, categories. I think for for games, I think probably Overwatch is pretty similar to, to League of Legends in that it's going to be pretty controlled. Um, and that's again, it has its, its positives and negatives. It's like the, the publisher is really going to create the, the pre preeminent tournament and, and program within that space and kind of everything else exists around it or underneath it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, I know it's a long winded answer, but all, I, I would say those three categories kind of, 
uh, describe, in my, in my opinion, the, the three types of categories for the games. Okay, so then being as obviously Counter Strike is my native game, is the one I'm most interested in. It's the one, in fact, I've actually worked at MLG events at as well. So I've kind of seen some of the behind the scenes of what's going on. And every time I ever talked to anyone, you, any of the other people involved from MLG, you guys sounded super excited about Counter Strike, actually. Like, people, I realize when I say that, it doesn't mean anything to a random fan because they'll think naively that, like, every tournament organizes like this, or that maybe, you know, people just tell us that because we're the CS talent to, like, blow our goes up or whatever but actually it's not that often you know there's a lot of people who i mean i won't list names but who run cs events and some of them are actually like have like a chip on their shoulder like you know they're just like oh it's bullshit you know like we don't get the biggest event or whatever and uh, or they're like oh we just run counter strike because you know it's so big you know but we'd rather do this whatever our other game is you know that's our main business but even though uh, essentially to people in counter strike because you're coming from the console fps days we, you were initially viewed as outsiders you know and people would think you know maybe you'd do some events but it sounded like you guys in 2015 wanted to be heavily involved in Counter-Strike. Like you thought this was part of the future of, of the company, right? Yeah. I mean, with us, uh, with our league and events team, I mean, uh, we have probably, I don't even know what the current count is, 80 or 90 employees. And I would say the vast majority of that is working on MLG.TV, working on the sales uh, side, we're engineering. And the very small number of those people are actually league ops and events. So it's called like 11 people work on all of our uh esports programming um and the majority of them are here in ohio there's a few um in the new york office uh like i think one in in uh, santa monica but the we we uh we very much have to assess uh very carefully what we take on we're not a uh, we're not a white label event factory we're not going to just take on stuff to kind of churn out events and and take on as many publisher funded businesses uh opportunities as we can like we very much turn down a lot of business and we only take on things that we know we can give our 100% A plus effort to, we can assign our best team to, and that it's something that we care and we're passionate about. If we can't go in to a space and innovate and do something different and better than everyone in the space um, or put our own like spin and brand on it, we're not really interested in doing it. And CSGO was, uh, I, we felt like it was that opportunity for us. Uh, Aspen was um i think the first event we ran uh duncan you were there and yeah yeah that was uh i think beginning of 2015 and yeah. there's a lot of things we came in and just did different and uh we wanted to really level up what was going on and i feel like we achieved that and we we uh definitely entered it we we worked at sivo we we operated some online leagues um which is something we hate to operate online leagues when we can operate a living breathing you know live program it's where we can but kind of that was the climate of competition at the time you had to have some type of online sure. lead-in to really have um, a footprint um, but yeah CSGO was a big one for us it just it got it got crowded fast um, and uh, we the, the major was really uh, an awesome moment for us so it was right after we got purchased um, we we had won the business before we got purchased then the acquisition went through and um, to be I mean honest with you we didn't know if we we're gonna continue running events we didn't know what the future was and that that event was uh, very special to like a lot of people here, and that we really wanted to like go out with a bang, and um, we poured everything into it. And uh, that event's like probably our favorite event in terms of a team. Um, that in terms of our teams, uh, like our like um, it's it's definitely in the Hall of Fame. It's probably our number one event we've ever operated, and the team was one hundred percent hands down, like heads down to to get that one done. And yeah. um, it means a lot to to the success and the kind of the, the stories that we still see and like. Um, like if you think back to even when we ran Dota in 2013, like that was the first time anybody had done Dota in North America, the scale that we did it. And of course, like ESL's run some badass ones in stadiums since, and sure. people totally blown out of the water, but <clears throat> people still rank that as one of the best tournaments ever. And then we got very fortunate with the games that were played. I mean, I think it was, uh, the Chinese team versus, uh, uh, internal envy's team, um, yeah. speed gaming. And we yeah. had the Cinderella story and. But every time we run a game for the first time, we want it to be memorable. We don't want to just factory churn out like toothpaste. And, uh, you know, CSGO was definitely a big part of our plans. And, uh, you know, think, things have changed in terms of like the competitive climate and just the saturation and just like also like where we're able to spend our time. But I would definitely, we definitely still want to run CSGO when and, when and if the opportunity makes sense. Okay, so this is an obvious question. Is from the outside, if someone didn't know the politics, they would just think that for whatever reason, you just stop doing CS events. But as you kind of referenced, around the time that the major, this 
big, big event for CSGO was going to be run by MLG was exactly around the time when this whole Activision Blizzard situation took place. And so then immediately, again, people who were just on the outside thought, well, oh, if, if this is the person who develop, you know, publishes Call of Duty, can they really... Would they even want to run a CS event in a company within their company? And even more so on the other side, would Valve let them run a CS event? You know, yep. there was all these obvious potential clashes of interest. So I have noticed you've hinted a number of times about still trying to do a big event in CS and, and throwing your hat in there for the major and putting it out there that you've you've got venues available, etc. So clearly it didn't just kill it instantly. Like it wasn't just like one of those parties was like, no, it can't go ahead. So can you kind of like give us any insight on that sense? Like, was there any issue from the Activision Blizzard side of being involved in CS at all? Uh, does Valve actually care if it's in a publisher of a rival game that is involved? It, what, what's the status in terms of the idea of like, how, did you put a lot of effort into trying to run big majors and get the big events still? Give us some kind of a status update in that sense. Yeah, so uh, in terms of Activision Blizzard, no, they don't care if we run um, anything. Uh, you know, as long as it's not like we're taking our team of what, say we're running a CWL event or an event uh, that's already planned, like we can't take our best team and go do something on the same weekend. But sure. Uh, 100%, um, we are going to continue to pursue a third party business outside of the AB portfolio. Um, and after we were, after the acquisition went through and it was announced like uh, over like the Christmas holiday, um, I still remember I get an email or a call, um, and it was from the, the guys on the, the Valve, the CSGO esports team. And they're like, so we saw the news. What's that mean for our major? And, um, you know, I told him, I was like, we're 100 percent committed and dedicated to making this the, the best event possible. And they said, that's OK, that's great. That's all we needed to hear. And ever since then, we've never that topic's never come back up. They've uh, we worked a minor um, after the major. Yes. Um, I think that was for Cologne. And um, like they continue to send us the RFPs for the for the, the major program. And um, there's no trepidation on their side. And in fact, they, they've they wanted to work with us, I think. We were the front runner with uh, for the E League major, and uh, Turner got that, and um, they did a fantastic job, obviously. But um, we've continued to to discuss opportunities with the Valve team about running CS:GO, and we're definitely open and interested in it. I think the I think uh, one of the harder things with CS:GO with the major specifically is uh, uh, one of the things that I possibly don't agree with is that uh, part of the the program now requirement is to run all the minors, and I, that's a lot to do um, when you're not like a 100% focused CSGO company. And also, I guess as somebody that is well versed in running big events, um, it seems like maybe a waste of, of resources for that person to take focus off of running a badass major and kind of have to spread your resources and attention a little thinner to run uh, that many global miners. Um, I, mean, I, think I, can t I can just tell you actually, like I won't say names, but I've seen some of the people who've been involved with this sort of thing. And some of their staff have come into the major wrecked before even day one because they've been doing all the qualifier, the mine, you know. So it's a big workload. Yeah, and and my my opinion is is that the miners is a great entry way for for junior operators. I hate to say junior like to talk down or disparage sure. anybody, but people that are just getting like getting they want to run CS:GO. Like my my thing I always say when we're designing an ecosystem is. If you have, if you can design an ecosystem that makes people, that makes third party, third party operators operate your game because it makes sense for their business, you've created a successful ecosystem. And sure. if, if you can create something where those, there's a, the third party operators want to run those miners because it's good for their business and it's additive to the major, and you have more voices and more social churn and more hype because there's more people and more parties invested in, in operating that program to make it a success. To me, that's that's a win. So I, I just I think that. The major operators should be operate should be planning um, to uh, really to put double down their focus on the on the offline qualifier and the major, and that the miners should really be parsed out to to participating partners. I think that's one of the things that's really been prohibitive to us is that it's a lot for like five months to really dedicate uh, global resources to that many events so when some of them really are uh, uh, justifying in scope for you know somebody of our size. To be honest with you. 
So when you guys did the first one, the X Games Aspen, that was basically just on the cusp of CS blowing up. Like people will forget that, but 2014, there weren't that. Like I'll, just to give you a co context, okay? I think in 2014 I worked at four events. I think in 2015 I worked at something like 17. You know, so you can see just by the numbers there, that's when the game blew up. And you guys were really early. Also, it had kind of a unique gimmicks. It was it was at the X Games, obviously, and it was in America, which at the time we hadn't had that many huge events. You know, we'd only had the ESE basically so at the time I can understand why it's easy to come into the space at that point in time then for the SIVO events I mean they weren't the biggest tier one events you know it was running the finals of the LAN and it was kind of like uh, I mean obviously you're working with another partner there so when you did the major that made people think again like I said like right the it sounds like MLG, if not going all in, they're really making a CS a focus, right? They want to do the World Championship of CS. And at the time, the logic, at least in the industry, people thought was that the way the majors work is this. You win the pitch, right? You make a good, you give a great pitch to the Valve. You're like, this is how I would run it. Here's what I'd maybe do differently. Here's what I'd do well. If you win the pitch, the naive thinking, I'm saying naive, if you just look at the way history's played out, people thought, right, then what happens is if you do a good job, you're in, right? Then you're going to get another major, you're going to do all this. Listen, I'm pretty sure E-League thought that after they did their major, you know. Everyone thought this, partly because that's basically what had happened to ESL. ESL had done a couple of the first ones pretty well, and somehow they just kept getting most of the majors. So everyone thought, right, once you've got your foot in the door, then, you know, the world's your oyster, you can get out future ones. What have been the, tr the challenges here? Because it feels like on the one hand, in line with what you're saying here about if you want to run events, especially bearing in mind you're not all in on CSGO, it has to be a special event, you know, it can't just be a run of the mill. So presumably doing just another SIVO probably isn't that enticing. So if you've been at the level of the major, is it, it, would it only be worth it, do you think, at the moment for MLG to do a CSGO event if it's a major? And if so, what are the challenges with the game having blown up so much of even being in a position to get that? Because at the moment it feels like I think almost every operator out there is kind of a bit puzzled as to how one even gets a major now because it's switched between so many different people, you know. It's almost like they're going for novelty at the moment. Yeah, so um, I'll preface with some speculation, pure speculation, sure. my, the complete opinion. Um, I think that the majors get passed around a little bit because I think, um, again, can't stress enough speculation. I think that Val probably didn't like kingmaking the MTG guys. Um, that's yeah. how, at least my opinion, that uh, having them control that, that – because the majors are like a huge spot in your business. I mean, if you have that, you're you're it. Like you you are you're relevant, and people, the players and the fans, they take you serious. And to control the basically the Wimbledon's in quotes or uh, in plural uh, of CS:GO is a is a huge feather in your cap. So I think they wanted to spread that around. I think also too, and maybe this is a little contrary to what I just said. Um, they won those because there wasn't a lot of competition in terms of operators wanting to run CS:GO, and I think that's sure. Also a benefit to show their support that ESL and DreamHack and these guys were supporting it before anybody else cared. And that's why they got it. And maybe they deserve a little bit more, um, you know, maybe they deserve a little bit more, um, you know, consideration when they're, when they're par passing these out. Yeah. Um, now, all that said, I do think that um, everyone kind of leveled up their offering. I mean, le people leveled up like what they're going to bring to the table. It wasn't just uh, the same kind of cookie cutter offering. And um, the space definitely like went forward like 20 steps from what the, if you look at the majors from a couple of years ago to what they are now, I mean, it's not even a, in the same ballpark of event scope and production and quality and everything, everything under the sun. Um, so I think to answer your question though, would we have to run a major to run CSGO? It's, it's hard. I think the, the, the biggest problem with the majors and you said people don't even know how you get one. I think the problem is, is that it's, it's a chicken and the egg thing in that, you can't really bid on the major until you have an event planned. So you yes. have to go and you have to go out on a ledge and you say, I'm going to book this stadium or I'm going to put this stadium on hold if they'll let you put it on hold. I'm going to plan. I'm going to put all these details together. I'm going to hope and pray I get, I get the major. And if I don't get the major, then all that prize money needs to be on my books. The player T&E and &E, whatever other costs that you get covered within the major deal have to be on your books. So it's, it's very much um, a risk. And I think some – Operators just don't have the the checkbook to be able to cover that risk. So, um, in many ways, you have to make an educated bet on whether you think you're going to get it and uh, put together the right pitch. And um, if you don't get it, hopefully you can still have a badass event and everyone's going to come and you're going to it's going to be successful for you. Uh, but again, it's chicken and the egg. You don't know if you're going to get it till you have uh, like the event details to present to Valve. 
Yeah, because what you're just saying here is a very key detail. And I feel like people only became familiar with that aspect of how much planning goes into even having essentially the logistical ability to run a major if you win it. I think people only really started to clue into that when ESL didn't get Cologne as the major because it's fairly obvious with them having a Cologne in the past as the major and the fact they had they had already announced they booked the stadium. In fact, they announced that event long before anyone knew if it would be a major or not. And when it wasn't, I think that kind of made some people realize that except for certain pitches which you might be able to get away with, where it's something very unique, if you're going to run a massive stadium event, you're going to try and make it what everyone would hope a major would be, you gambling basically like you're you're having to put a lot of stock into this before you know if you it's going to be a major and if it isn't listen i think actually i realize listen it's it's not that great a, a most popular sob story to say oh poor esl because of some of the things they've done but i actually feel for them because in every way this year for ESL and Cologne, they did a fantastic tournament again. I think that actually won the best of the year, but it wasn't the major and no one will remember it as the major. And because the major was like a week later, that has absolutely been overshadowed. And I'm sure they put a lot of their time, effort and money into making that event what they hoped would be their biggest event of the year. So is there is there an obvious way to like I realize this is an area where I actually I'll give I'll give Valve the benefit of the doubt. They're not tournament organizers in general, you know. So maybe they just don't understand how stressful that is, how difficult it is to run the business. Is there a way to bridge that gap where you can still have amazing tournaments but also have this what they're trying to present as, you know, sort of a, a, they're thinking it's like a fair quality that people pitch for the majors, you know, like they don't just promise you one a year in advance. You kind of have to you know, show that you do something good with it. How do we find like a, a comfortable middle ground between the two? Because it feels a bit skewed towards the Valve side at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. It's, it's uh, I think a lot of stuff, they, and I'm going to uh, talk about some stuff that I might not have 100% of the details on, but um, I read enough to, to, a little bit enough to be dangerous on this, is that with Dota, for example, they announced a point system and that yes. um, kind of, that sanctioning system made those tournaments important in the context of everything. And I think CSGO could use something similar. Um, I think that the major should be static dates announced in advance and that the if the operators all had um, the like, I think that being able to plan that stuff like 12 months in advance to be able to know whether or not you're going like it is an example, like back up a little bit. If I'm going to book a venue, um, I can't do that four or five months out without really kind of opening a checkbook and putting a deposit down and being on the hook for that venue. Um, sure. But if I'm doing it a year in advance, um, and that's still pretty close, but I can put it on hold. I can have some time to pitch from a business development standpoint to try to win that business. And if I don't win it, then I get to say, hey, I'm not going to contract on this venue. Um, but when the majors are kind of uh, meted out so close to the actual event, it kind of puts the, the operators in jeopardy of having to run that event because they've had to financially go on the hook for it. So my opinion would be to kind of shore up the kind of lead into all the majors and to have more lead time for and be very public when the dates are. And then I think you could just reveal, hey, uh, the event's going to be a Malmo a DreamHack and it's going to be the same date we announced before and blah, 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 blah. Um, I think that the, the short nature of when they kind of announce these details is kind of working against everybody, Valve included. Okay. Since we now have had this run of events, where I think, I mean, ironically, it obviously began with MLG. We've had like a new operator for, I think it's like the last three now. And it's people who hadn't run a major before. And then each future one's also been, you know, someone else who just come into the space or who in the case of PGL kind of leveled themselves up. They got into the top level. Do you get a sense that from someone who was involved in some of those pitches that you didn't win, like without sounding like sour grapes or whatever, do you think that there was an element where they've gone as a reaction to the days when they used to give ESL to it to a year, where it's almost like they want to test out the newer people and see how they do with it, etc. Like it, like okay, I'll, here's the here's a weird analogy I'll give you. Okay, I'm one of these people who hates the concept in traditional sports of like voter fatigue for the MVP because in my opinion if, Re if LeBron James really was like the best player for like eight years in a row yeah it might sound boring but he should win eight MVPs in a row he's the best player you know so right. in that sense personally while I like the idea that everyone can pitch for a major I'll, I'll you okay just to make it fair I'll make the example ESL again let's say ESL really did have the best pitch then I don't care really that they did you know four events before that I think they should get the major each time they have the best pitch. It doesn't feel like that's how it works, though. What, what would you What would you say on that end? Um, speculation had again. I mean, 
I would, I would venture to guess that some of these pitches um, got a little aggressive, um, and I think that 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 conversation has probably changed now. Um, I think that now that it's been passed around, I think that um, folks that are pitching on it might be a little bit more humble about it. I think that um, there is like you need us to run a great event, and uh, I think now also it works in reverse now, and it's reciprocal in that um, I think Val probably sees the value in like a clone event, like having a a guaranteed badass production because ESL does a fantastic job at that event with 15,000 people in a stadium um, that like you really just can't, you can't just make that up overnight with a new operator. And um, I think, I think in the future, I think that though they, they probably wanted to see what, what if the numbers were affected, whether they went up or down, um, whether quality or technical issues affected, like um, they have the data point, what, what really affects how many people tune in or how many people buy things in game during the major. And I know that they dissect data better than anybody in the space. So um, I would assume they probably have a good sense of like what cause and effect these operators have. Um, and I think they'll go into that armed and into their next decision making process around who gets the next major. And I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see them go back to one of like the, uh, like an ESL or DreamHack or uh, some of their past operators. I think Again, they wanted to, in my opinion, speculation, they probably just want to have more data on like how the operator affects their, their key metrics of success. And I think they have that now. At the moment, in the past, okay, when people used to say that CS was oversaturated, so 2015, what they meant was there were just a lot of tournaments. Now it's oversaturated in as much as now the ruthlessness has begun. So for example, the, pe the people who got the most fucked in 2017 was DreamHack because they did everything that we've just described in this interview. They announced at the beginning of the year, here's our whole circuit, here are all the dates we're doing. And what happened was everyone who's bigger than DreamHack but who wanted to run an event then just said, tough luck. I'm going to run one anyway. I'm just going to announce mine a month before, two months before. I'm going to run it. And it doesn't matter that you're running an event, you know, in a different part of the world, but the same weekend, if my event's bigger, one of us has to lose and it's going to be you. And so in a way it's gotten ridiculously kind of wall to wall now. Does that put MLG off running a CS tournament? Will that, will that be a factor that would stop you? Like in the next year, for example, is it reasonable to expect that we could see a CS go tournament from MLG? I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that. Um, I'm, I'm not. I, again, I think if the opportunity made sense, we would be, we would definitely be down. And again, I don't want to just run a run of the mill tournament um, in the space. I think another thing too that's like worth mentioning is like factors of assessment. We 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 go to space. Like we don't have all the details around something like a WISA or these other um, unions that like that are forming and how that might affect participation and. Um, we hear rumblings, we hear rumors, and we hear we hear we read the uh, same Reddit theories and everything that yeah, oh yeah. these guys are going to be you know not allowed to compete at MTG or non MTG tournaments, et cetera. So that's the last thing I want to deal with when I'm running an event. Like I don't want to go to an event and I'm trying I'm worrying about making sure ten thousand people in the room have a good time and making sure the broadcast is, flaw is flawless, making sure the players are treated like rock stars. I don't want to be dealing with some third party leech that is is going to charge me through the nose to do it and make my life difficult when that's the last thing I need to worry about. So there's there's other things going on around the space that make the make the assessment around it. You know, also it colors it. Right. You got to, it's it's I'm sure in the end, a lot of these these um, I know it's like Scott Smith, for example, is working with the players on some right stuff. And I think that's fantastic. Uh, but right now we only hear stuff through kind of the grapevine around like that or around like WISA, around other things. And it's just, it's one other kind of element of, um, I don't want to say clutter or, um, it just makes, it, when events are already hard enough to run and having to deal with that as well and without all the details is also just like, fuck, do I really want to dive into this? And so that's definitely something as a, like another factor that kind of assess, like to assess is, are the teams going to even come to my tournament because they're not allowed to? Sure. So I actually had some very specific like almost like nuts and bolts questions about running events that are things yep. that, again, a lot of people don't know. So an, an obvious one I wanted to ask you, because it's a topic that came up recently, is whenever you have a tournament where it could be League of Legends, it could be CSGO, a fan 
or multiple fans can in any way influence the outcome of the match. You know, they shout when someone's going to be ganked in League of Legends, which actually happened at one of the World Championships. They have in CSGO, you know, someone's behind a wall and the fans shout and the person that happens to just spray the wall, you know. In these scenarios, the obvious point of discussion, which is a classic one to be revived, is always, this is why the game should be in booths. If you had a booth, you could help noise cancel more you could ensure that people c couldn't affect the game to the same degree and whenever that happens right there's a classic follow online which is people say oh but actually adam apicella said that when they tried to run mlg columbus they couldn't have booths because a fire marshal said he could have now i know from talking to you it sounds like well, as as America actually was designed to run like this, it's supposed to go based on like not only the type of venue, but what state you're in, and there's all there's all sorts of different laws, etc. So, can you give us a basic kind of lay of the land in that sense? Like, what was the issue at Columbus? Was that a unique one? Can most events, do you think, if they're in America, for example, run with booths in these sorts of stage setups? What are your thoughts along those lines? So, the one thing I'll say, and I know this is a really shitty um, example um, in terms of it will annoy people, but in baseball, when someone's stealing. That every time the home crowd will scream, he's going. You know, I mean, like okay. this happens in traditional sports. Now that being said, um, I I do think that any way we can mitigate um, things that can impact a competition by the crowd, we should do it. And Soundproof Booth specifically, yes, we 100% had an issue, and it depends um, down to the venue, um, to the sit, to the city, to the state. Um, Columbus. Um, they weren't going to let us open our, our arena here because uh, the booths were a fire hazard, they said. Um, and and uh, other venues we've gone to in Anaheim, they wanted us to, um, I think it was Anaheim, it's uh, one of the times since we had to 5v5 booths since League of Legends. They wanted us to to pay to bring a sprinkler down from the roof, cut a hole into the top of our, uh, our soundproof booth so that if there was fire yeah. and suppression needed to happen, that those, that that would spray inside um we've done stuff like exploring um can we have you know the because they're like oh they're in soundproof environments they can't hear what's going on if there's a fire alarm going off and can we put like light cues so that like just like when you see like the alarm going off they know that there's a problem and um every time we we try something it's it's the same thing we see with like kind of like the visa issues it's like the people we're dealing with don't really understand a space yeah um so they they are very um they're, they're 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 very unwilling to help or to be flexible. So Samper Boost became a situation where why am I going to spend a quarter of a million dollars on a prop um, that I'm going to have to cut the pieces depending on the city I'm in, and that's going to have different regulations, and I don't know what I'm good at getting into, and uh, it's it's really hard to 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 justify that. And also again, like just the wild cards of planning, like what you can plan and get checked off the list you want to do for an event, and. Uh, Soundproof Boost became one of those variables and wild cards where if we can't have a standardized field of play that we wanted to just go with the noise canceling headsets um, and know what we were getting into with every event we planned. Okay. Can the noise canceling headsets from, from your experience, is it just as good as the booth? So, um, it's, it, in terms of noise canceling, like even when you're in a soundproof booth, there's a soundproof, it's not soundproof, it's sound dampening. Soundproof, yes. like, it, it's, it's such a, a wrong term. It's there noise. There's noise dampening uh, booths. So I would say that I will say that um, when we had our booths, uh, there's two elements that it helped with. One, we had ambient white noise and speakers over overhead. So um, when coupled with the noise canceling headsets, it was additive to just the general buzz. And what we did in our majors, we actually had speakers. People said when they're in a front row, they could hear hornets. Uh, we had speakers over the players to to do ambient white noise to replicate that. Um, again, not the same same effect, but it was additive to um, uh, suppressing sound. Uh, the the big I think the big win that is pretty undeniable with booths is that their sound kind of you feel it right, and like someone's planting the bomb or you know doing a diffuse, like you feel the crowd roar and it hits you. And um, I know that's a really un unscientific way to 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 describe it, but it's it, it, you can just feel the sound. And with the the booths that wall. It, it kind of like stopped that to a degree, I guess, or it lessened it. Um, again, they would still, you could still hear the rumble. Like the crowd goes nuts and 10,000 people, I don't care if you're in a booth or not, you're going to, you're going to hear it. Uh, you're going to hear something happening. You're not going to hear like spoken word. You're not going to hear what they're actually saying, but you're going to, you're going to know something happened. So I think the booths do mitigate that to a degree, but it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't um, negate the, the home crowd effect. 
Sure. So this might sound like a really abstract way to make this question, okay? And, and correct me if, if any of this is incorrect. But I was once... What, okay, one thing I, I've always wondered about is that in America, you had all these tournaments in games like Halo, like Call of Duty, etc. And actually, in the UK, in terms of console, we also had scenes in these games, but the events were never as big, and they were never of the same status, etc. And just the size of the two countries alone isn't really like that big of a disparity. Like, yes, America is a much bigger country, but for example, obviously Sweden's tiny, you know, like, and by that logic, Sweden should never have an event in esports. But when I looked at it, I remember someone once telling me from the NA scene that, like, part of it was that if you ever looked at the locations that a lot of those early MLGs, etc., took place, it was usually, I won't say rural, but it was more out-of-the-way places, and it was more places that weren't New York, LA, you know, the, the massive blockbuster-type places. And they told me, again, I, I'm going off other people's word here, that it's because a lot of it was kind of like a grassroots thing that was built up, and in these areas you could host a tournament, and obviously with them being more out-of-the-way, you could also get cheaper venue, and you could get fans who might be more willing to travel because they're not in LA with a million you know, things that they can go and do every day and, and things they won't want to travel two hours for. And someone even contrasted it to me with how, like, uh, professional wrestling worked, where they said, you know, it wasn't until you got to the days of the WWE being, like, a global thing, you know, that they were in all the biggest places. They also used to go to, again, not disparaging, but kind of a little bit backwater places and places where there wasn't as much going on and they could be the main attraction, you know. And I don't know how much truth there is to that, but the reason why I lead into this as, as a very abstract question is because now we see people thought with games like CSGO being so huge, right, well, America's the country with all the fans who want to see these things. If you just get a big stadium and you go to a big city in America, job done, right? We're going to fill the whole place out. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have 20,000. And that hasn't really happened. That's been very touch and go for a lot of these events. So I wanted to know, first of all, is there is there anything to that kind of like the way I, the way that I set up the character of, of how the events emerged on a grassroots level? And if so, is there any tie into how you can go about setting up a big stadium event because it feels like people tried to make the jump up from where mlg was three years ago but just instantly they thought there was that you just could scale it up infinitely basically yes and no um when we when we first start like when when i first started working at mlg in 2003 um mike and science uh long story how i got into this but mike and science basically like okay great you took the job just so you know we had not we've announced a 13 city tour with dates and cities we haven't booked a venue yet so we went and we got the cheapest venues possible. I mean, like we had no money, we had to figure it out. And um, I would say the number one uh, thing for us uh, has always been uh, economics as a startup. Um, and even now as an MLG uh, that's owned by AB, that um, we still do stuff very lean. We do stuff leaner than, uh, way leaner than even our sister units. Um, uh, it just kind of how we approach things. And I'd say the number one thing that why you see um, some of these different markets and different venues is that uh, the number one barrier to entry for us to any venue and, or market is is union labor. Uh, if a market, if a venue requires uh, like the Teamsters and a Carpenters Union and Electrical Union, and we can't, it's our team. Um, we know how to do everything on the floor. We can we build everything. We own, we own eighty percent of what you see on the floor at our shows, whether it's the LED tiles to the projectors to the computers to the consoles to the monitors. We own everything and we set it up. We know we know it backwards and forwards but when you go to a market where you have to pay Vinny and bobby to, to to carry yourself off the dock and then you have to pay another guy to to plug it in and then you can't touch anything your costs literally go up exponentially um so a lot of the markets like uh that used to be the vegas strip and that's lessening now it's getting a lot better to chicago to downtown new york to the heart of la um philadelphia certainly there's cities that are just pro cost prohibitive for us um but also we did go to, we did, we do assess a lot of things around um, like people in game battles and like where our user base on MLG.TV and where our, where our site traffic comes from. And um, a lot of people kind of said we went to the Columbus major because of uh, we had an office here and we have an office here because um, first a, a few years ago, we, we brought, we completely got rid of uh, working with agencies we brought everything in house. We moved our production warehouse here because of um, cost of logistics. It was centrally located. We could hit all of our um, North American tournaments cheaply with trucking routes. Um, <coughs> but also that Columbus in general was in kind of the heart of a sports state and that we have, you know, uh, was it three or two baseball teams? We have uh, 
an NBA team. We have three football teams and uh, – is it three NHL football team? Obviously, NHL team, or we have two football yeah. teams. Sorry, and we have Ohio State. I, so I was okay. counting the third one. So we sold our tickets for the major. I mean, forty percent of our Ticketmaster tickets were to Ohio, and seventy percent were from Ohio plus the bordering oh, states. Okay. So the traveling, just like sports audience, in a lot of the Midwestern states, and a lot of the data we have from who is actually on our website, where they're at. Like Ohio is like the top five state for us in terms of site traffic. So um, yes, to answer your question. Um, it, a lot of that stuff is around like building a grassroots network and making sure we hit um, uh, a, a lot of different areas outside of just the major metro markets. But a lot of it, and the majority of it, I would say, is is definitely uh, cost considerations. Because now, like as I say, I mean, it's obviously not just in CSGO, but in CSGO, it's most notable because, as you say, it's such a wide open space that people are competing against each other from month to month to month. So you see that there are a number of big operators who want to run these huge events, stadium events. And now I realize in my own way, I was a little bit prescient on this topic, but that's one of the reasons why a lot of these massive companies that are based in Germany and based in Sweden based in Romania, suddenly they're running events in Poland and Ukraine and, you know, countries where perhaps it's, you get around a lot of the issues you're bringing up here. And also maybe you can guarantee a fan base is going to come to the stadium. But on the other end of the equation, people still want to run, you know, a huge New York event, a huge LA event, because they know that that's a great just PR for your own company, as well as it being a great event. You know, that's how you get more money into the space, you get more eyes on the space if you have the massive event. What do you think the... The challenges are for people to make those actually work because as we said with mlg it, it feels like you've gradually moved out like that you know you didn't just hop up one day from being in like well i mean some of them like raleigh north carolina you didn't just go from that to like yeah. we're, at, we're at the staple center next month you know so with all these companies a lot of them it feels like are scared especially because of what happened with that dreamhack vegas event you know that one's people are a bit burned from that is there a is there still like a disconnect that's stopping people being able to do the huge events is there a way to do it in a safe way and know that you can get that stadium and you can get that crowd? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, ESL chose Katowice because uh, obviously one of their key executives and um, is from the, is from Poland and um, that city's been fantastic to them. But I don't think anybody can deny they have some massive cost incentives to go there. And PGL event, um, I think their major was in is it Krakow? Yes. And, I mean, I looked into that. I mean, obviously an affordable market and. I, I think that um, people, I think we'll continue to see events that are uh, pegging uh, these these markets that are, you know, the barrier to entry in terms of cost to run your event um, is, is lower. However, um, when I first started, um, I used to, to beg venues in 2003, 2004 to, to let me rent a room, let me rent a ballroom. They would, a lot of times they would turn us down. They had no idea who we were. They're like, fuck yourself. This is, this is gambling or this is stupid. Um, and it gradually got better and better and better. And now today it's gotten to the point where, um, we're getting, we're, we have cities coming after us to come and how do we get, how do we, how do we give you incentives? How do we have you come here? And, um, you'll see stuff like, um, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen an event on the uh, Vegas strip resorts because of the union stuff I was talking about. And now you're seeing that strip is fighting for that business. Um, whether it's MGM or Caesars, that those guys all want esports desperately and are willing to relax or, um, work with the, in terms of the labor negotiations to make sure we're there and we're comfortable. Um, I think what you're going to see is I think you, these venues, especially these stadiums that are sit empty in a lot of the kind of the bat, the low seasons of sports and as, uh, some of these traditional sports owners come into the market to own teams and to invest into the space. I think you're going to see city and statewide, uh, initiatives to bring, uh, you know, publishers and third party operating operated events to those cities and markets. And I think uh, once those cost incentives are there and it makes sense financially, um, I think you're going to see those major markets unlocked for everybody. This might sound like a very naive question, but when you consider the sheer scale of esports now, it's a global phenomenon, people in every single region watching, then you consider the developers themselves now have actually to some degree made life easier for people who operate tournaments now i mean the developer sometimes gives you the money which was unheard of from the days i came from you know where you had to convince some other guy for no reason almost to give you money and then he maybe got some pr back from that so there's all these things that have that have happened that make it at least an enticing business i won't say how profitable because that depends on your company and what you're trying to do you know but you look at the current landscape there's not that many operators out of north america 
There's not that many big people. And yet, North America, just as a region, could support its own scene entirely. You know, it could just have tournaments there, could only run even with ton probably teams and players from there, and it could be its own thriving ecosystem. Why do you think, aside from MLG and, and the odd other person, I realize the SEA technically was in the space and was bought by ESL, why is there no one in an era when people can convince them, someone to give them 20 million to buy an Overwatch League team, something that's, you know, far from proven? Why aren't there people who... Competent people, you know, coming into the space, getting this massive investment and and being a tournament organizer, operator. Because obviously, I mean, the, the upside would be to position yourself if one day you are going to be the main league operator, you know, for a massive esport and get... That's when obviously there will potentially be the billions, right? So why do you think North America's kind of... When you consider the size of it and the scale of the amount of fans and the scope, why, why do you think it is kind of still a bit limited in terms of who's in the space? Well, I think... I think that um, if you look at publishers, there's, and if you look at an, uh, in an ecosystem for a game, there's two polar opposite ends of it. There's one is the mass participation, um, and publishers are bar none the best at it because they own the game. Everyone that plays the game touches the game. They're 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 part of that funnel that the publisher owns and operates. They own the game. The other end is these these pro leagues you see popping up um, and these massive programs that are publisher funded. Uh, no one can no one can operate just better than a publisher because they have the funds to do it. They have they they can monetize every time the the digital football snapped. Uh, they have different they have uh, you know all of our traditional sports revenue lines that third party operators have access to, but they also have the in game revenue. So they can outfund anybody. But in the middle, there's this this connective tissue between the two ends of the spectrum that uh, third party operators fill a crucial role in the ecosystem in. And I feel what the I feel. Um, a lot of the problem is is that uh, people aren't happy with being that middle ground, being that, how do I go from the kid that picked up the game to the kid that's in League of Legends? How do I operate my business within those those bookends? And I think everyone wants to be the NFL and people aren't happy to be something different. And I this the every game desperately needs that. I think I look at uh, what we're doing with Call of Duty and I hate to, I'm not doing one of these when I do it, but I, I look at the power of seeing 200 teams competing and thousands of people competing in a, in a live event yeah. um, and it's opening an inclusive system. And I think there's no reason this isn't, it's, there isn't present for every game. And uh, I think that if, if people could um, operators could kind of maybe get over their egos a little bit and, and try to make a business around that middle tier, I think that they would find a niche and a place in North America. And I think right now it's just everyone wants to be the biggest, baddest thing in a space and they're not happy with having, um, a good business, they want to be the biggest business. And I think what happens is people bite off where they can chew, they can, they get in this production arms race, they get in this prize money arms race, and they just, they put themselves in this tier of competition that um, isn't healthy for anybody. And I think that we desperately need that middle operator um, that's, you know, sits below the NFL or is additive in, to the NFL. Um, and right now we don't have that. And it seems like in North America, people don't want to play that role. Okay. Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. At the end of the interview, do you have a final message or something you want to thank or say hello to? Oh, totally on the spot here. Um, I mean, I, I uh, you know, we get a lot of support and, uh, you know, one of the big things we do, and I think it's pretty evident that um, we got our way to over listen. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's pretty amazing all the tools that we have at our disposal from social media to Reddit to, to the various forums and Okay, wait a minute. Um, Actually, I do have a final question. That, that okay. reminds me of something. Okay, I would, be, I would be remiss not to ask you this, Adam. Okay. Oh, God. When I've met you in person, okay, you're a nice guy, you can, uh, pleasant conversation. You, you, didn't, you, you didn't seem like some in, insanely charismatic person. You didn't come off like, you know, some like pickup artist guy, just everyone they see just like mesmerizes them, you know. But somehow when you get behind a keyboard and you go onto Reddit, you just... You lead everyone. You're the Pied Piper, you know. Everyone just dances to your merry jig, you know. They do whatever you say. It doesn't matter what the problem with the event is. You have become famous as the guy who has somehow, like, you figured out how to respond to people, how to do the PR aspect. And obviously, I will say, you did exist. You did come into a world where ESL were almost, it's almost like they were having an internal competition to do the worst PR possible, you know, like go out on official accounts and like blame the, the fans, you know, and, you know, all sorts of really crazy shit. But somehow you really have struck that balance finally, okay. Was that just natural? Did, are you someone who, have you 
have you is there some is there some way you've been able to level this up because some because i feel like a lot of people are jealous of how you've managed to kind of walk that line you know where you can say what's wrong but people don't blame you at the same time and they feel like you're listening to them it's a skill right yeah i mean before i got into mlg i was i graduated when i graduated college i, I went to work in campaign politics and uh i was taking a year off before i went to law school and my job was to drive around the 16th congressional district in Ohio and talk to constituents door to door and go to business to business. And I'm very much all about grassroots. And uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, the campaign principles um, I brought over to MLG when I came over in 2003. And um, I really cut my teeth on um, the forums. And uh, MLGs have a pretty awesome forum where the community was super active. And um, all the executives were active. Like I was on there all day, every day. And uh, you kind of have to you can't be a hard ass with the community and like i think it's such a such an asset that people like completely overlook that um we like we'll do exit surveys people do exit surveys at events and they're dying for feedback and it really baffles me why they don't talk to people that are on these social media platforms that are or want to talk to you about your event and you have free and open feedback and people neglect it like when I get when when if I'm at a live event and if I'm out there working on the floor that means I haven't done my job in terms of prep ahead of time if i but if I've done my job and ev and everything's functioning within the, the core processes we have in place, I'm able to wire into the to to the computer and be on Reddit, on Twitter, on Facebook, on you know, various forums, uh, depending on the game, and be interacting with the community. If I can't take live feedback and, and fix problems, then um, we're not going to have it like an optimized event. And that's been key for us is that um, we're able to completely um, engage with the community and and listen to them, and we genuinely mean it. And um, we read pretty much everything, and uh, it, it. I don't think our events would be even close to what they are if we didn't if we didn't engage in that feedback and take it honestly and try to to address the things that are given to us. Because again, it's free feedback, and I, I just it, it it's it's amazing how, like some of the improvements we've made to our show based on something a fan has said to us or somebody's yelling at us, and a lot of times we'll we'll engage directly with that fan that's cu cussing us up and down. And by the end of the day, they're like a huge MLG fan because we we showed them we personally care and we personally responded to them. And um, it's been great for us, to be honest with you. OK, so anyway, I interrupted you there. You were, you were giving your Oscar award acceptance speech. So continue. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that I, I appreciate everyone kind of sticking through uh, with us throughout the years. And, uh, you know, like with Mike and Sundance and the whole crew here, like it's, uh, you know, it's it's been a long it's been a long journey. And uh you know, it's really cool to see so many people that are just enthused about our brand and support us regardless of the game. And when we go into a new game, sometimes people welcome us open arms and sometimes like CSGO, they, they're like, get the fuck out of here and we win their trust. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, it's cool to, to have the support of the community. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's come a long way since where we started. It's fucking awesome to see where it's at now. So, um, appreciate all the support and, uh, you know, thanks for having me on. Hi, this is not too. A guy who's way too old and way too long involved in this game, and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. Hello guys, this is Gabriel Fallen from Team SK Gaming.